My wife Audrey and I met freshman year of college. She was fantastic to me. Tall at 5 feet 11 inches, slender with brownish blonde hair. I prefer tall, slim women and she met the criteria well. The cup size on top, thin waist, tiny hips, and a buttocks that could crack walnuts. When we first met and she looked at me, her eyes lit up like a child discovering all of the presents beneath the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. I'm six feet and two inches. I was on the swim team in high school, so I had a swimmer's build. Our friends were always kidding. They could tell we were thinking of each other since we were smiling so much. And the sex was great. For the first two years, we met for sex. Any further interaction was entirely coincidental. We had sex eight times that day. She woke me up at 1 a.m. After waking up, go to the restroom. We had morning sex before heading to class. We had a quickie at lunch. We had a quickie after school. We did another quickie before dinner. After dinner. We were studying together in her place when we took a study break to have sex. We went to bed around 11 p.m. and repeated the process twice before falling asleep. It was great. After a few years, we were still having sex at least four times per week. Due to our academic workload, we reduced our sex life to only two to three times on weekends during our last year. That's when Audrey made her mistake. Brad, the college basketball team's center forward, was the source of her error. Six feet and nine inches. Brad, shit. Everyone I knew texted me that night, encouraging me to check at Instagram photos. They were emailing me images from the celebration. Audrey was all over the guy, and later photos showed Brad and Audrey kissing. Finally, a partygoer gave me a video of Bradley leading her into his room by her hand, a huge smile on her face. I was pissed. I arrived at her apartment around noon the next day, and she was still asleep in her bed. She awoke with a bad hangover. I gave her the images, and she explained what happened. At least she was truthful. She got there with a few friends and began drinking. She ran into Brad, whom she had previously met briefly, and the two began hanging around. It got late, and she didn't realize how much she'd drunk. Brad invited her to his room to show her all of his trophies. The next thing she knew, they were kissing. Then they were naked in bed together. She claimed she didn't remember their having sex. She said she was inebriated and made a terrible mistake. She just loved me and felt terrible for making this mistake, vowing it would never happen again. She said she would do everything I wanted in bed if I would forgive her. She told me she loved me and wanted to spend her life with me. All of her pals, as well as the majority of my mates, told me it was a one-time drunken mistake on her part and that I should accept her back. Most of my friends who said that also said she was the hottest girl I'd ever meet and there was no way I'd find another girl as hot as her who enjoyed sex as much as she did. I was angry with her for about two weeks before forgiving her and accepting her offer to do whatever I wanted in bed. What shall I say? I hadn't missed sex for more than five days in over four years. She was continually apologizing to me, and by the time I'd forgiven her, I had lost my mind. But I told Audrey that if it happened again, we'd be done that she was fortunate to have this one chance. Looking back years later, practically all of the guys who advised me to forgive her because she was so hot are in bad relationships because they choose women for all the wrong reasons. Every single guy who told me to dump her is happily married now. None of them are divorced. It appears that putting loyalty ahead of attractiveness has some merit. Except for that one error, I had very little idea. Audrey appeared to be the ideal person. After college, I obtained a job in programming. Audrey landed a position as an administrator at a huge corporation. She had a 45-minute commute each way. I got to work from home the most of the time. We married at the end of the year and welcomed our first kid, Matt, the following year. We welcomed his sister, Marcy, the following year. Life was good. Denial. My career was growing nicely. Audrey decided along the road that she wanted to make more money and started selling real estate. With her natural height and beauty, she was drawn to more luxurious properties. Audrey's income has also increased. Audrey's hours began to increase, and we were able to work while our sex life declined. To say I am a trust but verify type of person is an understatement. I hadn't forgotten what happened the last time our sex life declined. Within a week, I had installed surveillance software on her smartphone and a speech recorder in her purse. Two days later, I received recordings of her having sex with a man named David, according to the GPS on her phone. They were in his apartment, which was across town from her office. 
My heart was torn, like a drowning man grasping for something to hold on to. I realized they had never told or texted each other anything endearing. No, I love you. No, you are the greatest. No, I missed it. I felt like there was still time for me to do more, to win her back for myself and the children. When she arrived home, I had cooked her favorite lunch. The youngsters were dressed quite nicely. I adored her. She seemed to like the attention. I told her how much I loved her and how we needed to spend more time together as a family, and she agreed. I was glad I had a chance. I was winning the pygmy dance. I began sending her SMS photographs of the kids whenever I could. When I spotted her texting David, I would text her and tell her how much I loved and missed her. I was ecstatic when she told David she couldn't make it to his apartment on Wednesday. On Friday night, I had my brother and his wife babysit the children. I brought Audrey to a five-star restaurant where we ate and danced. That night, we attempted to break our record for sex in one evening. We didn't make it, but it was a fun attempt. The next day, we picked up the kids and took them to a water park. We spent the entire day having fun in the sun, playing with the kids, and enjoying ourselves. Life was fantastic, and I thought this would work. Audrey's text to David on Wednesday morning completely destroyed my heart. I'm looking forward to seeing you. I missed you. My wife was living. Everything I believed about her was false. I was not going to listen to her justifications. I wasn't going to allow her deceitful lips tell me which times in our lives were genuine. I wasn't going to listen to her telling me she was broken and needed my help to fix her. Audrey, as far as I knew, had abandoned me and the children. She simply hadn't given up her visitation rights yet. I saw David. I activated her camera using the monitoring program, and when she took out her phone to put it on silent mode, I caught a glimpse of David's face. I recognized him as Audrey's co-worker. I met him while visiting her office one day. He made a bad first impression. Now there was no doubt. After opting not to go to jail for hammering douche into a greasy patch on the ground, I concluded that the best course of action would be to remove Audrey from the children in my life. Every day, she lied directly to the children in front of me, the people she claimed to love the most in her life. I would take advantage of every flaw in my wife's life. I'd work out how to obtain as many assets out of the marriage as possible. As the primary parent, I would seek primary custody of the children. I'd also show the kids and our family how Audrey was choosing her lover over us, so they wouldn't be drawn into her deceitful lies. And I intended to make Duchess retribution as permanent and unpleasant as possible. He was going to pay me his fair share. Marcy had her band recital the next week. I addressed it to Audrey when I noticed she wasn't paying attention, as had been customary. But Marcy was the day before her recital. I utilize Audrey's phone's monitoring app to update her calendar. Reminder for the day following the event. After I got at school, I checked Audrey's phone to ensure she was at Douche's place, and then used the monitoring program to ensure her phone was set to mute. I left a message on her phone, inquiring where she was. An hour later, I left a message informing her of her tardiness. She contacted me at the conclusion of the band recital in a panic, asking if Marcy had played yet. I asked her where she was, but she disregarded me and inquired about Marcy again. I lied, telling her she only missed her and that we'd see her at home. Marcy was upset on the way home because her mother wasn't present. I informed her that grown-ups might get caught up in trying to help everyone in the family and find it difficult to step away. Marcy appeared to accept the answer along with Matt, but they were both depressed. The travel home, Audrey being late, and arriving near the conclusion of family functions had become the usual. When we got home, Audrey was waiting at the door, still dressed for work, but smelling like she had just taken a shower. She tried to make amends to Marcy with heaps of attention. Marcy played the poor victim card, which children are adept at. After a few hours, Marcy hugged Audrey and told her mother that she couldn't miss her next recital. I wondered if Audrey was truly regretful. She skipped her daughter's recital, or perhaps she was concerned that missing it would expose her cheating. Next, I saw Audrey and Duke would meet alone in the same small cafe on the outskirts of town. The eatery was mainly renowned for its Scottish eggs. I somehow got into a conversation about Scottish eggs with my father-in-law, who noted that he hadn't had a good Scottish egg in years. I stated that I had made reservations for the restaurant on Wednesday, the day Audrey and Douche frequented there the most. I picked up and drove my in-laws to the restaurant. Looking at my phone, I noticed Audrey was still at the office. I traveled the scenic road with my in-laws, 
Halfway there, Audrey's phone was traveling toward the restaurant. We finally arrived a few minutes after Audrey. I entered the restaurant after my in-laws. When I walked in, I noticed Audrey in a booth in the back, sitting just by Duke. I questioned loudly, Do you want to sit in a booth or a table? Out of the corner of my eye. I noticed Audrey's head jolt up. Her eyes widen, and she scoots her buttocks to the opposite side of the table, as if she had been shot out of a cannon. Douche had a puzzled expression on his face until he noticed us at the door. He then attempted to hunker down as we were seated. Audrey hopped up and came over. Mom and Dad, what are you doing here? Dad smiles, pleased to see Audrey. We heard about their fantastic Scottish eggs, so I decided to stop over and try some. Audrey's father reached in for a hug from Audrey. Audrey? Well, they are excellent. Why don't you all sit with me and my co-worker? We are just sitting over there. She pointed to a booth in the rear end of the almost empty restaurant, and Douche waved back. His cheeks and neck were flushed. The smiles on both parents' faces evaporated. Audrey's father moved two steps back to stand close to his wife, holding her hand. Mom, her smile gone, glanced at Duke and remarked in a monotone voice, Well, we wouldn't want to interrupt your business lunch, Audrey exclaimed excitedly. Not an issue. We were only eating a quick meal before going out to show a property. Let's just say that lunch was weird. After Duke shook everybody's hands, Audrey spoke virtually the entire time. My mother-in-law frowned and stared at her food the entire time. My father-in-law's smile vanished the moment he spotted Duke, and he gazed at him the entire lunch, never saying a word, not one word. I asked simple inquiries like, how long have you worked there? And how come you, such a nice guy, are still single, my favorite? Audrey has a single sister, Audrey. If all goes well, you should pair them up. We could be related. Audrey's smile was clearly strained. Duke. After a far too lengthy hush following my statement, I answered no thanks. I've got a girlfriend. I asked, really? Is this someone we know, or is this a secret? And you don't want to inform Duke? She's in a poor relationship and is in the process of ending it. It would be impolite for me to reveal who he said it to with an obvious sneer on his face as he glanced exclusively at me. I told you he was a douchebag. The smirk faded when he noticed everyone at the table was staring at him, especially Audrey. Our meals arrived. The in-laws, who are generally sluggish eaters, devoured their meals. I just took a few nibbles of my Scottish egg. Audrey saw and inquired if the Scottish egg wasn't particularly excellent. I told her that I had lost my appetite and glanced at her. Audrey's mother gestured wildly at the server and handed him a $100 bill to pay for everyone's lunch. Everyone praised her and she sprang up claiming she had to use the restroom. The waiter returned and Audrey's father collected the change. He stared at Duke as if he were something disgusting. He had unintentionally walked in and went straight to the restroom without saying anything. I informed Audrey and Douche. Sorry for interrupting your business lunch. I am sure you have ideas to discuss and people to deceive. I also mean to sell. I rose up and started to walk out of the restaurant. Audrey chased me outside to my car. Audrey, it was good to see you for lunch. We can debate this at home. Your folks will be out in a moment. I could see Audrey's mother and father exiting the lavatory hallway, virtually racing straight for the front door without looking at Duke. Audrey, seeing my gaze move over her shoulder, looked at the ground and remarked, I suppose that would be best. The in-laws arrived, hugged Audrey briefly, and left without saying anything. I walked away from Audrey, saying nothing to her. We didn't say anything the entire way home after I dropped off the in-laws. I got out to say goodbye, like I usually do. Mom gave me a great embrace and told me she adored me like the son she never had. Dad gave me a sideways embrace and instructed me to bring the kids over. He missed all of us. That was the first time he offered me more than a handshake. Dad had to help Mom up the front steps. They appeared a lot older than when I picked them up. It saddened me that Audrey thought having some bizarre equipment was worth lying straight to her parents' faces. Karen is Audrey's younger sister and the in-law's other daughter. They'd already disowned. She had two failed marriages, both of which were caused by her infidelity. Both times, she lied to her parents about the cause for her divorce. Karen had been lying to her parents about thinking her second husband, who was actually a kind person, was harsh and cheating on her. 
That ended when a friend emailed the in-laws a video showing Karen kissing a married man in a restaurant booth, similar to Duke and Audrey's. Audrey's parents knew the married man's parents since they were all in diapers. Audrey's mom and the married man's mother were lifelong closest friends. They were closer than sisters. The married man got divorced, leaving behind his wife and three children. He ended up relocating across the nation. The in-laws' friends left church. They had spent their entire lives trying to avoid the in-laws. The in-laws' friends never spoke to them again. Karen's parents have not spoken to her since, despite the fact that she resided in the same town. Audrey mentioned Karen a couple times, and her parents quickly interrupted her and told her not to utter her name again. Karen once attempted to sneak into the in-laws' church during a Sunday sermon. Karen's father jumped up and interrupted the pastor in the middle of his lecture to apologize for having to leave right away with his wife. They both departed through the door nearest to Karen, never recognizing her existence. Everyone else acknowledged Karen's existence by glaring at her angrily as her parents went away. Audrey returned home that night with a lovely story, how the lunch meeting with Douche resulted with a big transaction for them both. Audrey having lunch alone with an unmarried man is unacceptable. I do not want you near him anymore, and I don't want you to ever go out to lunch with him again, even in a group. Honey, I apologize for that. If that bothers you, I won't go out to lunch with him again. Do not worry about him. We made the big sale. I informed Audrey that I would be sleeping in the guest room until she adequately apologized to me and her parents. I mentioned your parents were upset. Remember how your sister was busted cheating? Audrey was noticeably shaken when I reminded her of her sister, but she said I was overreacting on the plus side. I finally had an excuse not to have sex with her. Next, I installed a kill switch in both my wife's and Douche's cars. I hid it in Duke's car while he screwed my wife at his apartment. I shorted off a transmission sensor which will activate his engine light and keep the mechanics guessing. We had a parental divide and conquer day. Matt had a soccer game and Marcy had a band competition to attend. Audrey chose to play with Douche that afternoon. This is what I heard live from her phone while watching Matt play soccer. I disabled Audrey's automobile. Knock, knock, what up? Be back so soon? My automobile will not start. Let's have a look. Fifteen minutes later. I don't know what's wrong. Your battery is charged. The lights are turning on. It's simply not starting. Do you want me to drive you back to your house? No, you idiot. If my husband saw you drop me off at the restaurant after the incident, he'd be furious. Call a tow truck. I'm supposed to pick up Mary and take her to her band competition across town. Can't you let hubby take her? He's with Matt at his soccer game. We had already planned for me to take Marcy. You are welcome to take my automobile again. Devastating restaurant experience. Oh, yes. Okay. Take me to a car rental, and I'll have a tow truck come and get my car. Make sure to meet the tow truck driver when he arrives and pay him $1.50 to place our work address where the automobile was located. Audrey's phone rang. Oh, shit. Hello, honey. Me? Are you on your way to pick up Marcy yet? I am having automobile problems. I believe it's the battery. Would you like me to stop by your office and give you a jump? No, that's all right. I've already ordered a tow truck, and I'm going to rent a car from a nearby shop so Mary doesn't arrive late. All right. Call me if you need assistance. I hung up. Let's go now. You're driving me to the Avis location near our workplace, but there's a budget just up the block. Jeez, I can't have a car rental bill from a location that isn't near my workplace and just up the street from your flat. Oh, yes, right. Needless to say, Audrey was late picking up Marcy. Fortunately, Marcy contacted me in a panic, so I asked one of the other fathers we were friendly with if he could take Matt home afterward. After he consented, I was allowed to bring Marcy to the competition. Barely. When Marcy and I arrived home, Matt was already in his room, and Audrey was waiting with her apology to Marcy, still dressed for work but smelling like she had just gotten out of the shower. Marcy, I'm very sorry. I was unable to pick you up due to car issues. I got a rental, but Dad had already picked you up. It's okay, Mama. I just got to the competition on time. Thank you, Dad. This is the second time in a row that you have missed my recitals. I hope work is going well for you. Marcy rushed off to her room. Audrey pleaded with me. It was not my fault. I had car issues. I contacted your office after lunch, and they informed me that you had already left for the day. You had more than two hours to get Mary. What happened? Audrey froze and didn't breathe for three whole seconds. Then she regained her calm and added, I had some errands to run and thought I'd have plenty of time to complete them. 
I had no idea my car would cease working. I stared Audrey in the eyes for a few seconds, noticing her small fidget. When she realized what she was doing, she stopped and gazed back at me. Which errands were you running? You never said anything to me. I glanced at her intently. Nothing. Just some things. I needed to get some things done, I said. So I hope that tiny thing you needed to accomplish was more important than your daughter's affection, because you're on very thin ice with that stunt. I then went up to bed in the spare bedroom where I had been sleeping alone. At least I was able to answer the question I had casually pondered. Audrey didn't care about missing our children's events. She just cared about screwing Duke. She was just concerned about being caught. If she actually cared, she would have called off her sex frenzy for the day. Instead, she used her children's event as a pretext to leave work early and spend extra time screwing Duke. The mechanics would suffer greatly the following time. Audrey's car appeared to be in good working order. When Marcy learned about the automobile, she pressed Audrey's buttons. Hey, Mom, remember how you said you'd take me and my pals to the mall this Saturday? Please let me know if you do not want to take us. We do not want to be stuck at the mall while you are out having automobile troubles again. Matt heard from the next room and laughed, yelling. Marcy, you did well. You might suppose the children felt neglected by their mother. Audrey even had the guts to complain to me about it later and ask me to counsel the kids on how to communicate with their mother. I'll consider it. Audrey, I'm waiting for your apologies in the guest room. She didn't appreciate the irony. She only grew irritated and blamed my seclusion in the guest room on my stubbornness. Saturday, I dropped off and picked up Marcy and her friends from the mall. Audrey mentioned that she had things to accomplish. Audrey did not visit Douche's apartment or a hotel, but her car did spend a few hours at a residence. I looked it up. The residence was advertised, but who was there with her when we arrived home? Marcy made a big show of thanking me in front of her mother. Marcy stressed how much she appreciated me taking the effort to drive her and her pals around. Marcy contacted a buddy and ignored Audrey's questions. Audrey appeared to be about to complain to me, but I chuckled at her, grabbed up my drink, and locked myself in my office. Audrey was still wearing her work clothes, but she smelled like she had just had a shower. She had botched up someone's house that she was selling. I hope she had the decency to change the bedding afterwards, but I doubt it. Matt has a birthday celebration coming up. We decided to rent out six lanes in a bowling facility and invite his friends and family to bowl together. It took some searching, but I eventually discovered a bowling facility that did not have a league on a Wednesday night. What luck. I told Audrey everything about it. She visibly swallowed hard. I suppose Wednesdays weren't ideal for her. I told Audrey I'd pick up both kids and a few extras for the celebration. I needed her to pick up the cake and candles from the grocery shop. We'd blow out the candles and eat pizza while Matt opened his presents. Then we'd all bowl for a few hours. I had to destroy Duke's car three times the week before Matt's birthday party to keep them apart the following week. They arranged to have lunch on Tuesday, so I had to permanently damage his automobile. Douche had to drive his car to the shop instead. They couldn't discover anything incorrect, so he received his car back late that afternoon. I was hoped that their pent-up rage would allow them to make it through Wednesday. I was relieved to see Audrey's text this time on Wednesday morning. I look forward to seeing you, a bit after lunchtime. Her phone's GPS showed her heading towards Douche's apartment. There's plenty of time for her to have fun, get the cake, and head to the celebration. It also allowed me plenty of time to pick up Audrey's present, have fun, get the kids, and head to the party. I went to get the car I'd rented for this particular occasion. I wanted a car with a roomy trunk in case Audrey's present opened in the vehicle. After ensuring Audrey's phone was in Douche's apartment, I took my bag containing Audrey's present to Douche's front door, gently placing the pet cage, which had been blacked out with black material, against Douche's front door. I opened the cage by pulling the door straight up. The only thing blocking the front of the cage now was Douche's door. I then took my recently purchased handy-dandy door breaching ramp, practiced three swings, and crashed it into the door with a loud crash. I took my taser out of my pocket and momentarily discharged it against the metal cage. A very enormous and extremely angry skunk burst into the room. I swiftly reached into the room and closed the door. As the skunk prepared to fire at me, I dashed back to the rental car. 
After driving away, I linked to Audrey's phone microphone. There were screams and hollers. I heard douche vomit. A positive sign. He must have been sprayed with the skunk's perfume. I could hear Duke telling my wife to contact the police. So I locked her phone. In her distress upon hearing the sound, she would believe she had typed the code incorrectly too many. Douche had to open his bedroom door to fetch his phone from the living room. The skunk let go after hearing the yelling, another successful shot. Douche finally called the cops and claimed them there was a wild animal in his flat and that he needed assistance. The cops arrived in roughly 15 minutes and discovered traces of forced entry. The police entered with their rifles drawn. The skunk fired first. I heard both cops yelling and vomiting before they closed the flat door. It took a few hours for animal control to arrive, restrain, and capture the skunk. After animal control had left, two stinky cops sat across from two stinky people, Audrey and Douche. Two additional cops had arrived to assist, but when they smelled the flat, they swiftly left. Cop, who lives here? Douche I am. And who are you? This is my driver's license officer, looking at Audrey. Do you reside here, Audrey? No, I was only visiting. Do you have any ID? Is this actually necessary? Listen, lady, I was just sprayed by a skunk and vomited for nearly five minutes straight. Do not play games with me. I'm not in the mood. Here's my license. How do you know, douche? We work together. So what are you doing here? We stopped by to pick up some papers, following some discussion on their mix to validate Audrey's and douche's identities, the officer inquired. So what was the skunk doing inside the apartment? Douche began to respond, but Audrey stopped him off. It was a birthday present from me. You purchased a fully grown skunk as a birthday present for your boyfriend? He is not my boyfriend. Cut the bullshit, lady. Boyfriend. Girlfriend. Co-worker. Whatever. Why would you buy a fully grown skunk as a birthday present for your boyfriend? Actually, I didn't, but I did. I purchased the skunk, but it was meant to be young and neutered so it would not smell or spray. Douche told me he liked skunks and had always wondered what it was like to own one, so I surprised him. It was not expected to be fully grown. They brought it to the door, and as Douche opened the bag, the object shot out and splattered him. The cop was obviously not believing this nonsense, but he also didn't like sitting there stinking, remarked the skunk. It must have been pricey. Kind of, but not horrible, Audrey remarked, attempting to play it down. You buy pricey dogs for all of your co-workers without consulting your husband or boyfriend. Audrey didn't respond. Boyfriend? It is. And what about the door douchebag? I inadvertently broke it yesterday and hadn't had a chance to repair it yet, I can only imagine. The officer must have stared at both of them for the entire minute of stillness. Then he replied, All right, both of you. I know you're both full of shit, but I'm sick of this scent and am leaving. The only reason you and your boyfriend are getting off is that you both stink worse than me or my partner, and I do not want to stink up the back of my squad car with you two. With that, I heard them leave and the door close. Being broken, it was loud to close. Douche. What the hell was that about? Audrey. Always the bright girl. We couldn't tell them that someone kicked open your door and hurled a skunk into your apartment. Why not? Because they would have asked my husband what occurred if he had done it. He already knows. If he didn't do it, they'd have to inform him that I was here. Audrey speaks sweetly. Be truthful. Douche. How many other ladies are you screwing? There were no outraged responses. When was the last time you screwed a woman other than me? Approximately a month ago, with humility. Audrey. You prick, say it loudly. For how long? For around eight months. Audrey. Even louder. You were screwing her the entire time. You were screwing me. There was another one around six months ago, he murmured. Have their husbands found out? What makes you assume they're married? Because I know what sets you off. Now answer the question. Yes, both. Were they aware it was you specifically? I am not sure. Great. Now I know I did the right thing by lying to the cops. It was most likely one of your previous victories. Husbands take revenge. In any case, I plan to find out if my husband was to blame. Douche. If it is, I will kick his bomb. My wife's phone calls me. Hello, Audrey. Have you received the cake yet? I know she heard bowling pins being struck down in the background. Shit. I got caught up with my work. I am leaving right now, Audrey. Do not let Matt down. I am leaving right now. Do not worry. Audrey hung up her phone. Mike? Audrey? Shit. Matt's birthday party. I need to grab the cake. Next. 
Audrey was taking a shower, dressing, and leaving Duke's place when her GPS indicated she was almost halfway to the grocery store. I killed her automobile after she tried four times to start it. I let it start. It died three more times on the way to the supermarket. Fortunately, it restarted every time after it died. Audrey realized she'd be late for Matt's party when she arrived at the store. I heard her apologize to the bakery personnel for hitting a skunk. They were fast to assist her on her journey. Audrey arrived at the bowling alley near the finish, bearing the cake. We all covered our noses and began gagging. After a brief discussion, Matt appealed with his mother to let him go home after the party. Driving home. Matt questioned why Mom was often missing his and Marcy's events. I told him she was doing what she thought was best for the family, and that it's difficult to be in two locations at once. Matt, but you're always there for Marcy and me, and you earn significantly more money. Well, I now have more flexible hours, which allows me to spend more time with my two favorite skunks in the world. Marcy. Not hilarious, Dad. It'll be when you tell your pals about it at school tomorrow. Even the birthday cake smells so awful that we had to throw it away. The birthday cake stank. They both thought it was really humorous. I was grateful to be sleeping in the guest room that night. A few days later, after Audrey had bathed in gallons of tomato sauce several times, I noticed her poking her head into my car and smelling the upholstery. It was hilarious to watch my wife. When she returned home, she resembled a mouse, sniffing for cheese. I discreetly followed her up the stairs to the master bedroom closet. I watched her around the corner with my phone in video mode. I captured a wonderful image of her getting down on all fours and sniffing all of my shoes. I never asked her why her automobile did not smell like skunk from the outside. Two Saturdays later, I informed everyone that I had some hardware shopping to do after asking everyone whether they wanted to go to the hardware store with me and receiving negative grunts in response, I went out alone. I went straight to Douche's flat. His automobile was there. That was a positive indicator. I knocked on his door. He answered the door and asked, Can I help you? Actually, I believe we can help each other. I'm Audrey's spouse. Can I come inside? After his face became pallid. I pushed my way past him and sat at the kitchen table. I encouraged him to sit at the table with me. I could smell fresh paint and a lingering skunk odor. The furnishings and carpet seemed brand new. I know you've been banging my wife Audrey for more than six months. Hello, guy. I'm not sure what anyone has been telling you, but it's all lies. We're just pals with a few photos and a video capture of your typical Wednesday interactions. Refresh your memory. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Cut the stuff, douche. I know you have been banging my wife, and I have proof that you do not matter to me. What my wife is doing works. So here's the deal. Instead of paying a private detective to obtain incriminating photos of my wife screwing you, I decided to simply offer you the money. You want me to videotape myself screwing your wife? It would be worth $2,000 to you guy who stared at me for a minute, allowing his puny brain to digest what I was saying. He looked around at all the new furnishings he had recently purchased. Two grand for a recording of me screwing your wife. Are you for real? Yes, I am. Two grand for a recording of you screwing my wife. It must include her face, torso, and actual penetration. I will also need a formal consent document from you that states you created the film and authorized its sale to me. Why would you need the video if you already have so much proof? I want more leverage in a divorce, man, and cheating her like that would be cold. Oh, you mean how she cheats on me and her children in barely a whisper? Yeah, like the two grand. And don't inform the other two spouses who have just cheated on their wives to sweeten the bargain. I'll even pay for a seat for two, a few towns over. You can screw her all day in the hotel spa on a Saturday. Douche sat silently, watching me intently. Dude, you are quite cold. Make it three grand and you've got a bargain. Great. Of course, Audrey was not informed of this. I will set up and pay for the spa and hotel reservations in your name. It will be next Saturday. On the evening of Monday following, I'll call you to schedule the video pickup. I'll pay you with cash. Is all clear? Yes. Good. Make sure to capture her face and attention in the photos. I'll email you the consent form later today. You will hear from me the following Monday. I subsequently left his residence and resumed my hardware shopping on Wednesday evening. Audrey, honey, I forgot to tell you, I have a conference on Saturday, a few towns over. Will that cause a problem? No. It looks like a slow weekend for this Saturday. Have fun during the meeting. Monday evening, I contacted Douche and told him I would meet him in front of his apartment. 
He inquired why, and I explained that I didn't want to appear in any videos. I took him up and instructed him not to say anything. I drove him out of the freeway to a seldom-used rest spot. I had him step out and scanned him with a metal detector. Once he was clear, I told him to get back in the car. Do you have what I want? Yes, here it is. And he gave me a thumb drive. I take my laptop from the back seat and plug in the thumb drive. The video camera must have been sitting on the dresser at the foot of the bed. It displayed an empty bed. Then Douche lay on his back on the bed. Audrey entered the picture, climbed between his knees, and began giving him a boob job. But I could clearly see Audrey's face. In the following scene, the camera provided a side view of the bed. Audrey climbed on the bed while entirely naked. God, I enjoy being screwed from behind. It feels great. The next video shows them screwing in various positions. I told Douche it was wonderful. This is just what I was hoping for. Have you got the consent form? Douche removed an envelope from his jacket and handed it to me. I opened the envelope and made sure the date and signature were correct. I snapped a picture of it and forwarded it to myself. I grabbed an envelope from the side door panel and gave it to Douche. He smiled as he counted all of the hundreds in the envelope twice. I dropped him off at his residence, he said. Please let me know if you need another video. That was the most fun I've ever had. Making money. Anger. On Tuesday, I first informed my brother and his wife about what was happening. I showed them a short clip from the video. Then a few images from the other videos. I also showed them a list of dates she had with Douche, highlighted in yellow. She missed the family celebration since she was with Douche instead. I then showed her parents a photo of Audrey having sex on the movie. I extensively removed the majority of the picture. It only revealed Audrey and Douche's heads and legs below the knees. I didn't want them to be haunted by a photo I showed them, but I also didn't want Audrey to lie to her parents. I also questioned how long Audrey had a shoe obsession. They said that they were unaware she had a shoe fetish. I showed them a video of her sniffing my shoes, every pair I owned. This video appeared to disturb them the most. I suppose by messing about, they could comprehend the motivation. However, we are sniffing shoes. I told them she was always happy in the shower after sniffing all of my shoes. Days later, I observed that all the shoes in their house had vanished, and their bedroom door remained closed. I demonstrated the same thing to my parents. My father laughed out loud at the shoe-smelling video. I also instructed everyone to avoid Audrey until I gave the go-ahead. On Wednesday, when their mother was screwing Duke, I sat them down and explained what was going on. Mom has a man, and I'm not sure if she loves me anymore. After the shock, they inquired whether we were getting divorced. I informed them that I would discuss it with their mother when she returned home from her boyfriend's house today. They yelled together, she is in his place right now. I said yes and pulled out my phone to show them the GPS tracker in her car. Marcy stated the obvious while visiting her boyfriend's residence. Is this why mom is constantly missing out on spending time with me and Matt? I showed them a dated list of their mother's meetings with highlighted missing family activities. I wanted them to understand just how unimportant they were to their mother. I then showed them the time-lapse tracker that displayed Audrey's location on Marcy's missed recital day and Matt's missed birthday. They began to cry when they saw what time Audrey left the office on Matt's birthday. They were openly crying when they saw what time their mother had left Douche's flat to attend Matt's birthday. Darn that skunk. I told them the most important thing was that I loved them, that this was a problem between their mother and me, and that we would do everything we could to keep the family together. After a half hour of crying, hugging, and talking, we heard the front door open and Audrey entered the house to bargain. When she saw the look on everyone's faces, she became concerned and inquired, What's wrong? Kids, why don't you go to your rooms while your mother and I talk? Both stood up and hugged me, then gave their mother a filthy look before walking to their rooms. When I heard the door close, I asked Audrey to sit down. What's happening? Audrey, I know you had an affair. Oh God, no, this is not true. I'd never cheat on you. Why would you say something like that? Audrey's eyes began to swell up with tears. Audrey, if you do not tell me the truth, this talk is done. There must be an error. Someone believed they saw something that was not true. All right, Audrey. We're done for today. Please take the rest of the day to think about what you were doing to this family. We will address this further tomorrow. In the meantime, please do not contact me or the children until we have sorted this. 
I then got up from the table and went to my room. The guest room. Audrey followed me all the way, telling me I was mistaken. When I shut the door in her face, she stopped speaking. Next, I heard her trying to speak gently through Marcy's door. Marcy, what did Daddy say? It's all a mistake. Please open the door so that we may talk. Marcy remained quiet, but she texted both me and Matt. Can you make her leave? I'll try, although she already informed me I was mistaken about her affair, so there is no purpose in having an open discussion if she is going to lie. Perhaps you're making a mistake. I have photos of them naked in bed together. Oh. I opened my door, and Audrey gazed at me. Please leave the children alone until we have resolved this between us. You're making things harder for them than they need to be. But I'd like to know what you told them. I told them the truth. You have a boyfriend. Aside from that, it is between you and me. Please leave the kids alone while we work this out. Audrey walked regretfully inside her bedroom. I heard sobbing from her room for the rest of the night. The next day, Thursday, I sat at the kitchen table, waiting for Audrey to come home. The children were out at their friends' houses. They did not want to be anywhere near this. Audrey, please sit down. Audrey sat down. Have you considered what you were doing to your family? She nodded her head. Yes. Are you willing to have an open chat with me about your affair? She nodded her head. Yes. So, what can you say for yourself? It's all a misunderstanding. Yes, I've had an affair, but it was simply an emotional one. I've had several lunches with Douche. Even though you asked me not to go to lunch with him, but we have to work together. I have told him about some of my feelings, but that is all. Believe me, dear, I love you and only you. So because you believe that lying your way out of this situation is the greatest option, this talk is finished. I will chat with you again this Saturday morning at 9 a.m. The children will be staying with my parents tonight and Friday night. On Saturday morning, we will chat again. Again, please consider what you are doing to this family. I got up and went into my room. Audrey said nothing and didn't follow. Saturday morning, 9 a.m. I got up early Saturday and ate breakfast with Audrey's kids at her parents' house. When I arrived home, I parked my car in front. When I entered the house, Audrey was sitting at the kitchen table. I asked, Are you willing to have an honest conversation with me about your affair? Audrey bowed her head. Yes. Audrey, did you tell my folks about this? Yes. Did you tell your parents? What are your brother and his wife saying about this? Yes. How could you do this to me? Because I've always enjoyed bragging about your hard work. Consider how much effort you've put into your affair. All the lies to myself, the kids, and our parents. Lies. You told us why. Looking directly into our eyes. All I had to do was remove the thin veil of trust you were sheltering behind. But it wasn't like that. I only kissed him a few times, that is all. And now, you've turned our parents and children against me. This talk has ended because you continue to refuse to be honest with me. The kids will be staying with their grandparents for the foreseeable future. I'll be staying in the guest room and working from our home office, as always. We'll talk about it again on Tuesday after you return home from work. Please consider what you're doing to this family. I got up, left the house, and drove away that night. When I returned home from eating dinner with my parents and children, Audrey sat in the living room. Audrey, may we talk? Tuesday, I said, and then went to bed. Audrey's pals sent me a handful of text messages imploring me to forgive her. It was only an innocent error. I FaceTimed them. I told them Audrey had been banging Duke for months. I then showed them an unredacted photo of me having sex with Duke in a short video. They both apologized and hurriedly hung up. I never heard from them again. I don't believe Audrey did either. I don't think Audrey was completely honest with her two pals. Furthermore, married women have a tendency to continue cheating three-quarters away from their husbands, particularly infidelity. 304 is as attractive as Audrey. Audrey arrived home on Tuesday evening, and I came out of the home office to find her sitting at the kitchen table. She had brought home some spaghetti from our favorite Italian restaurant and prepared a dish for me at the table. Audrey was exhausted and had bags under her eyes. Days spent contemplating which lies to tell your friends and family so they don't discover what a terrible person you are. Does this in a pitiful me voice. No one will speak to me. Lying will do that. They think I'm a monster. Actually, Audrey, you've demonstrated to everyone that some part of you is a monster. They say you showed them a photo and video of me and Duke together. Yes, I did. 
Nobody will show me the photo. Can I see it? My girlfriend says you presented it to them on FaceTime. I love when a plan comes together. Yes, if it will benefit this conversation. Just so you know, I have not authorized any further copies to be distributed. I do not intend to have our family mocked because of your behavior. I showed her the unredacted photo from the video. I really love you. Can't we just forget about this mistake? How strong was your love for me that you had to be with someone else? I've never loved him. Marriage is rather straightforward. Shared duties, trust, and pleasure. I was completely accountable. I completely trusted you and had a great time with you. But you left me with the majority of the financial responsibility. Most family responsibilities. You carried the entire burden of trust while spreading your joy throughout town. I stared at her for a minute. You took my love while you were offering it to someone else. How long have you known? Seven months. She spoke very quietly. Seven months. Why have you waited so long? At first I hoped it was a one-time error, and you'd be open with me and accept your error because, as you repeatedly state, you love me. I apologize. How can I believe what you're saying now? I adore you and am telling you the truth. Is this the same truth you told me during our previous three encounters when you denied having an affair? After a few minutes of sitting silently with me and staring at Audrey, Audrey began staring at her food. Audrey, what can I do to make things right? I retrieved an envelope from the home office and placed it on the table in front of Audrey. That's a post-up agreement. Sign that, and I'll consider accepting you back. To make this work, you, I, and the kids will all need to go to therapy. I don't want to sign a poster up. Fine. Then we're done. As far as I am concerned, you only want to get back together so that you may exit this marriage on better terms financially. What will I get if I sign up for this post? If any of us decides to divorce, I receive 70% of everything. If I am detected cheating, it is back to 50 over 50. If you are detected cheating, I receive 85% in all scenarios. I gain complete custody of the children, have an attorney review it for you, and sign it. I will only contemplate staying in this marriage if I am confident that you are willing to make some financial sacrifices. How much time have I got to make a decision? Audrey asked me Saturday morning as I was about to depart. If I was going to eat, I purchased your favorite. Should I expect the arsenic sauce to be especially fresh after everything you've done and told me lies? She started sobbing heavily. Sign up for the post so that you can reclaim some of my faith. I went to Audrey's workplace the next day while she was not there. I had an appointment with the office manager. She was a matronly lady who had spent many years working there. Her husband was the owner, but he never came to the office anymore, based on the glances I received from everyone in the office. Audrey had told her lies. How can I help you today? They're definitely giving me the evil eye. I believe there is a misconception that I am the evil guy in regards to my wife. In any case, it appears that this is a personal concern unrelated to this office. If that is all, I have a busy schedule and would like you to vacate the premises. If you refuse, I will have to call the police. Actually, it is pertinent to this workplace since it concerns my relationship with my wife and a certain douche who works here whom she is screwing. She didn't like it when I cursed in her presence. Do you have any proof to support this accusation? Certainly. Here's a photo of my wife and her co-worker. I also have dozens of phone recordings in which they admit they were meant to be showing clients' properties, but ended up screwing them. I played brief excerpts from two of the most incriminating recordings. She was quite unhappy. Can I suppose that my wife will be fired immediately? Yes, beside Mr. Douche. Unfortunately, you cannot fire Mr. Douche. I had authorization to record my wife's chat, but not Mr. Douche's because none of this is admissible in court. Ally, I do not want to be sued for slander. And I doubt you would either. Thank you for this information. She appeared visibly relieved. She almost grinned. Can I keep this photo? No, I do not want the photo to be circulated to pique people's interest at the expense of my family. Audrey arrived home upset that day. She had lost her work and would not receive any recommendations. She wanted to converse, but all I could say was Saturday before heading to my room and locking the door Saturday morning. Audrey was seated at the kitchen table. Did you have to fire me when you knew? Did I find out about your affair? You should have quit your job immediately to avoid Duke. I just made the correct decision for you. Your moral compass is clearly broken. What I actually wanted was for her to feel financial pressure to accept the position. We could have discussed it first. Sorry. 
I thought we had agreed that we would never longer discuss decisions that could have a harmful effect on our spouse or children. Speaking of which, have you signed up for the position yet? Yes. When he handed me the envelope, I noticed that it was signed and dated. I emailed an electronic copy to my lawyer and stored the actual copy in my safe. I then went over the new house rules, best behavior by her, and we would all begin counseling. I would also inform everyone in the family that we were trying to restore our marriage. I knew it wouldn't last. I didn't even bother scheduling any counseling appointments. For the next 30 days, my wife was the model housewife, lovely and caring. She was even willing to place a small camera in my office so she could see what I typed and what was on my computer. I observed her putting it on my concealed office camera, which I only monitored from my laptop in my car while away from home. When I arrived down to the kitchen on Saturday morning, Audrey was seated at the table drinking coffee, looking like the cat that ate the canary. We exchanged pleasantries. I got my coffee and sat opposite her. Where are the children? I brought them over to my folks. Why? We haven't had sex in a month and I was expecting to change your mind this morning. Eight months. Actually. Eight months. What? What do you mean by eight months? That is how long it has been since we have had sex. It hasn't been very long. You are wrong. I understand your confusion. Screwing around so much, but believe me, I'm the one who hasn't received any in eight months. I am not wrong. Audrey. Well, we could modify that. Audrey smiled at me and began to rise, but I waved her off. Audrey, I still remember everything you did and said, and I haven't been able to wipe those images from my memory. This is not going to happen. So, be hard-headed. I tried to be pleasant. I've completed all you've asked, and you and the kids continue to treat me like a pariah around here. I want everyone to start respecting me more. Start now. Is this really how you want to approach things, Audrey? Yes. In fact, I don't appreciate being coerced into this situation with your sex movies. And I did something about it. I removed all of your copies. You made a mistake by admitting that you were keeping control of your copies. I even removed your cloud backups and destroyed your small thumb drive. I have been watching you. You're so predictable. I'm tired of being treated like a pariah in my own home. So I'll be staying with my sister until you come to your senses and start treating me with respect. You no longer have the photographs to hold over my head. I've secured another work and will take care of myself. I will pick up the kids from school every day and eat dinner with them at my new apartment without you until you begin to treat me better. Audrey stood up and approached the front door. Surprisingly, her sister went out of the dining room and both of them left the house. Audrey spent two months working on her parents and children. She said that I never had any recordings. She said the extensively censored photo was heavily blacked because I put Audrey's and Douche's heads onto it. She informed the kids and her parents that if I really had the evidence, I should reveal it to them. Of course, Audrey had deleted everything. The kids weren't sure who to believe. Audrey's parents wanted to believe her. I could detect some skepticism in my parents' eyes. It wasn't that they didn't trust me. Rather, I was losing the kids' trust. My brother and his wife had viewed the films. They were completely on my side. Now I felt like a pariah. I met with Duke to plan another video session. This time, I pulled out all the stops. In Florida, I hired a hotel room on the beachfront. I paid for three very well-endowed male escorts. Three was overkill, but I needed insurance in case one or two didn't show up. I purchased two first-class tickets for Audrey and Duke, and I offered Duke $5,000 for the video. I also told him that it had to be recorded from the hotel suite balcony. Surprisingly, Duke said Audrey was playing hard to get. She requested me to pay for a fancy restaurant to wine and dine her. I knew he was milking me for more money. I listened in during the lunch. They'd ask Karen along. Audrey and Karen were really pleased to meet Duke's friends. I had to purchase another first-class ticket for Karen. Two weeks later, I was sitting in my car with Duke, watching the most recent video on my laptop. Audrey, Karen, Duke, and the three male escorts started the film by heading out onto the balcony. Everyone was already sweating. Karen inquired as to how Duke and Audrey got together. Karen responded, I've been covering for my boss for years. When she screwed Duke on Thursdays, she asked me to cover for him for a few months. Someone informed her husband that they had seen her and Duke together, so she had to quit banging him. I asked her if Duke was any good. She informed me he has a large tool. She began covering for me every Wednesday. 
No surprise Boss Lady was happy not to have to terminate Duke. Audrey is now out of the picture. She was going to get some more Duke tools. One of the other guys hurled his little tool into the crowd. Everyone thought it was humorous except Duke. Everyone sat on the recliner chairs and drank their beverages. After a while, Duke got hard and started screwing Karen. Duke screwed her for approximately 15 minutes. Duke got up and entered the motel room. He appeared in a few moments and handed the other three gentlemen small blue pills. After 15 minutes, all four males were rock hard. Audrey had obviously been broken into at the hotel room. Everything was just what I had asked for, for the next two hours. Audrey was made airtight while Karen was the unsuspecting fluffer. When I finished seeing the video, I told Douche, Great job. I encrypted the video before uploading it to the cloud. I also encrypted the copies on the thumb drive before placing it in my pocket. I closed my laptop and placed it in my briefcase in the back seat. I then drove away from the rest station. Douche requested for his money, but I told him I had a few questions first. Did you approach my wife first? Not really. It just kind of happened when we were working together. Who mentioned sex first? Actually, she did. I knew she had discussed it with her supervisor because she brought it up so quickly. By now, I'd turned down a two-lane road and we were on our way back to town. Really? How many ladies have you dumped around town? I've just been in town for a few years, but I've dated seven different ladies. Really? Who are they? I can't tell you that. That would not be correct. I will give you another grand. Make it two and you have a deal. If you include where and roughly one, we can make a transaction. He then named all seven. The office manager, two other women from the office, and four women from two different gyms where he worked out. Everyone was married. I switched off the recorder in my pocket. I told him, Wow, that is ridiculous. Want to see something else? That's crazy. I pressed hard on the accelerator. The automobile accelerated to 70. Douche said, Hello, man. What are you doing? I do not need to see anything outrageous. I apologized. That wasn't the crazy part. This is the insane part. I slammed on the brakes as I aimed for the trees along the side of the road. My luck held out, and we were going less than 40 miles per hour when we collided head-on with a tree, both of us wearing seatbelts and airbags deployed. We were both saved, but it still hurt a lot. I regained my composure first. Duke was still sleepy in the seat beside me. I reached over, pulled a pencil from the ashtray, and pushed it into Duchess's jugular. It was not bleeding as much as I had feared. So, when Douche went for the pencil in his neck, I twisted it around, causing as much harm as possible. Douche was looking at me with amazement, attempting to grasp the bloody pencil. I finally let go and he took it out. He dropped the pencil and attempted to stem the flow of blood spurting from his neck as it poured out. He stared at me and I stared back. My actions spoke louder than words could. After that, I picked up the pencil, wiped off all of the blood, and wrapped Duke's bleeding hand around it. I did not want my fingerprints detected on the pencil. The fewer questions, the better. I pulled dollar five hundred out of my front pocket and placed it in Duke's front pants pocket. I then contacted the police to report the collision. The police later decided that the death was accidental. I said that he was holding the pencil before the accident happened. As expected, they confiscated my laptop and thumb drive for proof. I returned home after being checked out by the medical staff. I was sore for a week. When I went home, I explained the blood on my shirt and what had happened, but I didn't specify whose blood it was or who died. They inquired why I hadn't called them. I assured them I was all right and didn't want to worry them. I also didn't want them to inquire why I was in the car with their mother's lover. Audrey learned about my wreck when she found out about Douche's death the next week. She put two and two together. She called to check on me following his death. I pretended ignorance, and not coincidentally, the police showed up the next day and asked me some questions about Douche's and my wife's adultery. I acknowledged to knowing about it, which was why we were in the car together. I had given him money in exchange for never seeing my wife again, but Dallas had breached his promise and was now demanding more money. Then the accident occurred. The cops played games and put pressure on me. So I finally said, are you claiming that I purposefully crashed my car into a tree, intending that only Douche would die? Douche had some bad luck. That pencil penetrated his jugular. Hey, it wasn't my fault the person got unfortunate. They basically left after that. 
Yes, I had the opportunity and motivation, but I'd known about their affair for a long time, and my fingerprints were not on the pencil. And who would put their life at danger by driving into a tree at high speed in order to kill someone else? How would you prove this in court? Audrey contacted a few days later and said she wanted to meet with me to discuss our marriage, but since his death, she wanted it to be on neutral ground. She also asked her sister to accompany her since she did not feel safe alone in a room with me right now. I asked her what she had in mind. She stated that the house was out of the question. She did not want the talk taped. She said we could meet at a random hotel she'd choose. I told her, fine, but I get to choose the room. She tried to argue that she was the one in danger and should be able to choose both, but I told her that I didn't want this conversation recorded by her either. This way, no one would know the final room until we were all about to step in. I started wondering what Audrey's true goal was in this. She could have just met me at the house as before. She certainly did not want me to record what was about to happen. We met on the next Saturday afternoon. I followed Audrey and Karen in Audrey's car to a luxury hotel across town. When we got there and checked in, the hotel attendant assigned us room 216. I informed the attendant that I preferred a higher floor room with a view of the hotel's front. I asked the attendant to list several rooms, and then I chose one. Audrey and Karen were clearly let down. I suppose they'd have to pay again to get their recorders out of room 216. They'd have to forget the bribe they paid the clerk in the elevator. Karen moved next to me, wrapped her arm around my waist, leaned her jugs into my side, and said, Regardless of how this turns out, I hope we can still be friends. I told her that this was a discussion between my wife and myself, and I preferred that she not get involved. I was probably the only guy or gal Karen had openly flirted with in years that she hadn't screwed up. Audrey didn't trust her sister with me, and she would have urged Karen to take her hands off me. I suppose things had changed. I was not whining. The hotel room had a standard arrangement, an office workstation with a chair, a dresser along the long wall, and a queen-sized bed in the other corner. Audrey inquired, What now? I smiled and said, Strip completely naked. I do not trust you. You don't trust me. Audrey gazed at Karen. She's my sister. I don't want you to see her naked. Oh, please, she doesn't own anything. The majority of people in this community have not seen it yet. Karen stuck out her tongue at me. She got her tongue caught in the center of it. Okay, then. Audrey gave up far too easily. The strip, entirely naked, had worked. I now knew another of her ambitions. Fortunately, I arrived prepared. Audrey and Karen started undressing. I quickly removed all of my garments and neatly put them on the business desk, my back to Audrey and Karen, and my clothes sandwiched between them. I removed a pin from my jeans pocket and placed it behind my clothing on the tabletop. It perfectly matched the other hotel pin on the desk, including the hotel name. When Audrey recommended her hotel scheme, I spent the next day visiting every hotel and motel, collecting free pins from each front desk. When we arrived at the hotel, I took a pin from my collection and positioned the camera on top of it. I hollowed out each pin slightly so that the camera could fit in them. There was no visual change, yet the pin with the camera was substantially heavier than a typical plastic chip pin. I picked up my clothing, walked to the restroom, and placed them inside. I never lost sight of one of them while they were undressing. More crucially, the pin grabbed a towel. I then walked naked back to my work chair and sat. Audrey and Karen sat on the bed in their bras and panties, with their garments beside them. Karen, could you please place the clothing in the bathroom? After Karen returned and sat down. Okay, you two lose the underpants. Audrey, this is good enough. We don't need you spying on us when we converse. Everything. And I want to see those butt cheeks spread wide before we talk. Karen felt indignant about revealing her bare body, which was utterly unlike her. I am not standing here with you staring at my privates. Fine, there is a door. You can stand outside while Audrey and I have our conversation. I knew what Audrey's little game would be about, and Karen waiting outside would disrupt it. Audrey was obviously unhappy that her ideas were going to fail. Karen gave Karen a knowing glance before taking off her bra and underwear and sitting on the bed. Karen, this is not good enough. Stand up and bend over. Karen looked to Audrey, who nodded. Karen stepped up, turned around, and spread her buttocks. 
There was a recorder taped to the inside of Karen's butt cheek in her butt crack, along with a tiny microphone dangling out at the top. Audrey had accurately predicted that I would make them undress. She only prayed her underpants would remain on. I rose up, walked over, and tore the tape off. Karen yelped, turned, and sat down on the bed. Her face was somewhat red. Was she humiliated or aroused? Knowing Karen, she was piqued, looking at Audrey. You're next! Audrey stood up and spread her buttocks. Recorder number two. I reached down and grasped the tape's edge, but this time from the bottom, causing my knuckles to crush into Audrey's kitty. After struggling and pressing my knuckles into her cat, I took the tape off. Audrey turned around and sat on the bed. Her chest heated, indicating excitement for her. Audrey felt no shame. I then walked in between Audrey's legs and started running my fingers through her hair. Their butt crack recorders were so little that I assumed they could conceal one in their lengthy hair. Yes, there it was, secured with a bobby pin. I threw the recorder on the pile alongside the others. Audrey, these seem costly. Did you spend your entire credit card limit on these? When I stood between Karen's knees and searched her hair, she slid to the edge of the bed, wrapped her legs over mine, and shamelessly rubbed herself against me. I took my time going through her hair, rubbing my tool on Karen's tits and my leg against her cat. I progressed from pudgy to half-hard. Looking at Audrey, I noticed a smirk on her face, which reinforced my idea about why we were here. Audrey should have been furious. My tool was pressing hard on her naked sister's tits without smirking at me. I removed the last recorder from Karen's hair. I handed the mound to Audrey and instructed her to toss it into the bathroom and close the door, as soon as Audrey turned away from us. Karen grabbed me and began offering me a job. I backed away and sat back in my chair as Audrey threw the recorders into the bathroom and closed the door. I could smell Karen's enthusiasm from across the room. If Audrey's objective was to persuade Karen to make me horny, I acted foolishly. I was scared that it was starting to work. My tool was poking up. Audrey leaned back on the bed next to her sister and stated, It's your turn to spread them. I stood up, bent slightly, and stretched my cheeks. Good enough. Karen, do not move. We need a closer look. I felt a hand on my bum cheek. Looking back, I noticed Audrey slapping Karen's hand and saying, Not now, Karen. I grabbed the towel and shoved it in the crack beneath the bathroom door. Audrey was last in there, so I assumed she had dropped the recorders I had taken near the bottom of the door. I also knew this would aggravate Audrey even more. I sat back in the chair. All right. Now that that is out of the way, let the cliches commence. I tried to resist gazing at Karen's attractive physique. Audrey, do not be that way. I was hoping to have a serious chat in a few minutes. We'll know who accurately predicted what this conversation was going to be about. Karen was still sitting with her legs wide open and leaned back against the bed. I'd seen Karen in a string bikini before and had to battle the urge to gaze. Then, but God, she has a stunning bare body. My wife is flawless, but Karen is off the charts. It didn't help that Karen was openly staring at my tool. This was going to be harder than I expected. Audrey in her sweetest voice. I love you, honey. Yes, exactly like your favorite pair of shoes. You understand that is not true. I genuinely love you. Sure, as long as your payment card works. Audrey's voice rises. Do not be so grumpy. Our marriage is strong enough to handle this. Strong? You used whatever was strong. We had to repeatedly puncture my back. And you want me to give you the knife back and turn my back on you again? Don't be too theatrical. This was a mistake. Yes, a marriage-ending mistake. Audrey leaned back and stated, I still love you. Take me to this bed and make me yours. Reclaim me. You appear to believe you're still a prize. You proved you're as difficult to acquire as a drunk. Three or four people in a pub at 2 a.m., everyone ultimately catches a ride. There is no offense to drink 300 force. Oops, I apologize. I mean, no offense, Karen. When I mentioned 304, Audrey sat up straight and crossed her legs. Karen, on the other hand, ignored the remark and smiled at me, spreading her legs even further. Honey, don't be like that. It was a simple mistake. It was not an easy mistake. It was a cruel and horrible plot, like placing puppies in a bag with a rock and dumping them into a river to drown. I use my best falsetto voice. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize it would kill them. I didn't intend to drown those 12 innocent puppies in that sack when I dropped them into the river. I'm sorry for lying to you, honey, but it was only because I was ashamed of what I was doing. 
I stopped lying when you challenged me, and I realized I was making a major mistake. Oh, you mean when I told you I knew and you stated there was a mistake? Someone believed they had seen something that was false, a lie. Or the second time you mentioned that everything is a misunderstanding. Yes, I've had an affair, but it was merely an emotional affair and a falsehood. Or the third time you claimed I had only kissed him a few times. A lie or the next when you told your two friends and had them phone me to persuade me to accept you back. Because that was a one-time error. A lie. I believe you decided to be honest when I showed you a photo of Duke screwing you up in the video of him having sex with you. I believe you chose to quit lying about your affair once you realized it wouldn't work. But that won't stop you from lying about anything else, right? Karen, observing her sister's restrained reaction to my statement, stated, We don't want anyone to overreact and say something they'll regret later. Looking shocked at Karen, I added, Overreact. Are you kidding me? I believe you are under-responding. It always amazes me how hard cheetahs struggle to keep other people from cheating. Karen, how many lovers and husbands have you cheated on? How many married men have you cheated? In reality, how many married women have you cheated? Karen merely stared at me, a smirk on her face. Audrey spoke in a low voice. But I sincerely apologize for everything I have caused you to go through. Oh, you feel awfully guilty, therefore everything should be forgiven. Unfortunately, I believe you do not feel guilty enough. My aim is to assist you with that shortcoming, Audrey, in a pathetic little girl's voice. <sighs> it's not that horrible. <sighs> Tell me, sweetheart, <sighs> what distinguishes you from a con artist? You know, a con artist. Someone who earns someone's trust and then utilizes it to defraud them. She returned to her natural voice. Uh, uh, I did not cheat you. Uh, marriage is a commitment to faithfulness and trust. You cheated on me and lied to me. How is that not defrauding me? I upheld my half of the bargain by adding a bit extra force to her voice. It was just sex. So that's why you kept it from me all this time? It was only about sex. And you knew I might become irritated over it, like the day you neglected to purchase me orange juice at the grocery store. Louder, with an accusatory tone, I was forced to sign the message. Uh, uh, N-U-P was unfair. Unfair? Uh -uh. If I receive a driving ticket, I will be fined. If I do not pay my taxes, they take my money. If I drink excessively and wander around in public, they placed me in jail for the night. Adulterous sex is going on in what? Nothing. This ruins children's childhoods. People get murdered because of this. People commit suicide because of what has been done to them. If life were fair, marriage licenses would be contracts that required adulterers to serve time in jail and forfeit 75% of their assets and primary custody of their children in the event of divorce. And single adulterers like Douche would receive the harshest punishments as they are essentially leeches on society, feeding off the happiness of others, I declared loudly. Marriage entails raising a family and remaining true to one person. Otherwise, what is the point of marriage? Audrey glanced at me, unable to respond. Audrey, do you realize how many long-term marriages begin with infidelity? Five percent. This happens to be the same percentage as open marriage. Was that your plan, Audrey? Divorce me, marry douche, and have an open marriage. Perhaps we'll never know. Well, we do. She's died. Audrey's face turned nasty and she developed a wicked sparkle in her eye. Okay, screw you. I removed all of your proof so you no longer have anything to hold me accountable. We've both been hurt and my parents and our children aren't sure who to believe. Was it worthwhile? Was it worth ending your marriage over openly pointing the finger at myself rather than Audrey? I did not end this marriage. You destroyed this marriage. I'm only declaring the time of death. Audrey was clearly taken aback by my response. She still believed that our marriage issues were my fault for catching her and being so unreasonable. Audrey was quite angry. Perhaps I wouldn't have screwed another man if you had paid more attention to me. Why should I? You weren't paying attention to me? Audrey appeared to lose her breath after hearing that answer. Audrey and I sat quietly for a minute, staring at one another. We both appeared to settle down little. Karen appeared to be ignoring our chat and was staring at my tool. 
Did you murder Duke with my back to the pin camera? I responded with a broad smile. It was a sad accident. How could you do such a thing? Audrey was attempting to persuade me to offer her an emotional apology for Douche's death or a moral justification for my conduct, but I didn't either. This might be considered an admission of guilt. So I responded, after we hit the tree. You should have seen the expression on his face as he was bleeding out. Audrey looked as if I had slapped her. I chuckled while pointing to her face. Yeah, that is it. Except pretend as if your throat has been shocked and you are unable to breathe. Or, as you've been calling it, lunch with your co-workers. Audrey's eyes started to water. He was a good person, allowing my fury to seep into my voice. Oh, you mean the wonderful guys who screw other men's wives? Unfortunately, he died. Wasn't he nominated for Humanitarian of the Year in the category of wife-stealing douche? You did not have to kill him, Audrey. Half yelled, now openly weeping. Is Audrey sad because life is unfair? If life were fair, he would have been in jail for a year or two instead of being in that car with me that night. But no. Our legal system turns a blind eye to adultery. So he could have walked away untouched after wrecking my marriage. My children have a nice household and the same marriage has remained sanctified without any protection. So to me, he received exactly what he deserved. Karma. Audrey spoke in a tearful tone. But you still adore me, I know you do. Correction, I used to love you. Even if they married, most people will never have the opportunity to experience true love. You had it from me for a little point in your life. All I got from you was your desire for a wedding. Your desire for a husband, your desire for my money, your desire for my faithfulness. You abandoned love for something as vile as desire because you never knew what true love was. Millions of men will exploit you for desire. You are currently damaged goods. No man will truly love you the way I did after what you've done to your family and myself. Audrey started crying. This had clearly not gone as Audrey had anticipated, but I had to give it to her. She regained her composure and got back on track. Audrey's eyes changed. Her thoughts was whirling. The primary plan failed miserably. Now for the next onslaught. Audrey sat up straight, dried her eyes, and looked me directly in the eyes, saying, I want a drink. Does anyone else want a drink? I'm going to go down to the bar and get a drink. Then I'll come back and hopefully we can talk about this like adults. Audrey then got up went to the bathroom, dressed, and exited the room. When Audrey first addressed Douche's death, the conversation became heated. Karen, still unaware to our chat, had begun to delight and touch herself. I have to admit, with Karen's wanton lust on full display and the beautiful aroma of Karen's sex permeating the entire room, it's probably the entire floor by now, my tool was quite rigid. Karen must work out frequently to have such a flat stomach and toned figure. She is truly genetically talented. I know Audrey saw what her sister was doing out of the corner of her eye, but she refused to turn around and acknowledge it. I was very sure there was a puddle under Karen's lovely bum by now, as the room door was slowly shutting after Audrey. Karen stated, Your meat looked delicious. Karen, this is definitely not the time. Karen got off the bed and approached me. You must be horny. Audrey informed me that she hasn't had sex with you in a year, and you have such a great, enormous meat. Karen... I appreciate your offer, but your sister will return in a few minutes. What? She doesn't know it won't hurt her. Karen grabbed me and yanked me out of the chair so we were both standing facing one other. Karen began giving her work. Audrey's backup plan was now in effect. I expected Karen to be involved in this scheme, but with the recorders in the toilet, Audrey would have no proof of my infidelity. I was hoping Audrey would propose a threesome to level the score. I was going to let Audrey and Karen start without me. Then leave. My guess was that Audrey would return and catch me screwing her sister on her phone recorder to level things out. This was not going to happen now. I only needed to get Karen to stop. I was arguing in my thoughts with my flesh, which refused to stop. Karen cried, Please stop! as she rapidly wrapped her arms around me and pushed me into the bed. The room door sprang open and Audrey dashed in, holding her phone in front of her. What are you doing with my sister, Karen? He is assaulting me. Make him stop. Audrey then pushed me off of Karen and pulled her from beneath me. Audrey stood straight, smiled broadly at me, and dropped her phone on the carpet as she picked it up. 
I noticed her hiding in the video. She then made a couple of additional clicks, which I believe were her transferring the video to the cloud. Audrey, you've done it. I caught you on film attempting to assault my sister. Thank God I decided to return to the room. I arrived just in time to save her. They both cackled at that one. So I sat back down in my chair, looking downcast, Audrey waving her finger in my face. This is how the divorce is going to proceed. First, there is no more post-snap. If there is any hint of a post-snap, I will send you to jail as an assaulter. I do not want to do that. You're only getting this chance for the kid's sake. Second, I want 90% of everything, and you pay all of the legal fees. I request full custody of the children, 50% child support, and 20% alimony for the remainder of my life. If you do not do as I say, myself and my sister on this recording will appear in court, and you will be sentenced to jail as an assaulter. Do you understand? Yes, I had misjudged Audrey. This final plan was clearly her main goal. She's a very brilliant girl. Good. You can screw my sister now if you want. Flirting with you has made her extremely horny. Audrey then gave her sisters a heavy slap. No thanks. I don't want to provide any evidence in an assault test. Audrey rose up tall and exclaimed, Smart boy! Audrey and Karen then laughed together. Audrey and Karen both tried to kiss me at the same time, but I turned to face them both. Karen immediately dressed. There are no bras or panties. Come on, Audrey, let's go bang some real males. This has gotten me extremely horny. I know three married guys who party every Thursday night and are always ready for some fantastic sex. Audrey had been crying for ten minutes because she had lost my love. Now she was walking out of the room with her sister, both laughing at me as she went to screw some married man. I spoke to myself aloud. I've looked behind your mask, and I don't like what I saw. I peered out the window till I saw them drive away. I then put on my clothing, grabbed my pin, and left the motel. The meeting went far better than I had hoped, but it was still tight. I lacked the willpower to prevent Karen from offering me a job. I had even less willpower to get myself out, if Karen had not stopped on her own. Audrey would have liked a film of me hitting her sister on the bed. That would have certainly hampered my plans. I hadn't had sex in a year, and my small mind was winning the fight. Audrey received her divorce papers the next day. The post-nuptial agreement was to be fully implemented when Audrey called and threatened me with her tape. I told her you didn't erase everything, and I'd never shown you anything I had. You've accused me of assault. I'll be free the next day and you'll be in jail. Audrey, as I already mentioned, is a bright young lady. She couldn't use her hotel meeting video at this stage because there were too many unknowns. I knew she would wait and see before revealing her ace in the hole. We both retained legal counsel. I refused to budge on anything. I wanted what was mentioned in the post-snap. I sent my lawyer transcripts of all of my pre-post and up recordings. My lawyer notified Audrey's attorney. Due to unforeseen circumstances, we were in the process of restoring Audrey's destroyed recordings and only had transcripts at the time. We went round and round in the legal conversations. I did not mind. I had planned for Audrey to pay the entire bill. Audrey also retained an expensive lawyer. Obviously, she assumed I would be bearing the entire bill. The lawyers eventually gave up and arranged the day in court. There were difficulties. Was the post-up enforceable? Did I actually have any recordings? Depression? Several days before the divorce trial, I had a special courier deliver certified letters to Audrey and Karen at Karen's residence. The letter was a fake, but an outstanding one. The Centers for Disease Control informed Audrey and Karen that just before his death, Duke had come into touch with someone who had full-blown AIDS and that test findings indicated he had contracted the disease. They informed my wife that she needed to see a doctor right away and that a representative from the Centers for Disease Control would call her to obtain a list of all her sexual partners during the previous year. It also stated unequivocally that she would not have any sex for the following 12 months until it was determined that she had not contracted the disease. It was convenient that Duke had died. I wanted Audrey to be as tightly wrapped as possible. Court date. The judge wasn't pleased with any of us. Audrey insisted on her innocence and that she had not violated the posting up agreement. In reality, she claimed that the persona was signed under duress. She'd never committed adultery, but she was terrified of losing her children and husband. She had signed the agreement without reading it or getting legal advice. 
She was terrified by the transcripts, believing they were admissible in court. In other words, I fooled her. She cried convincingly as her lawyer spoke. I, on the other hand, claimed that the post-NUP was formed because she was an adulteress. She signed it solely under duress from the divorce. She had broken the post-up agreement. She was an unfit mother, and the post-nuptial arrangement was just judge. What evidence do you have that she engaged in adultery? My lawyer created the video and voice recordings to back up the transcripts we had already created. Judge, why are you generating the video and voice recordings right now? We were only able to obtain the video and voice records after an extensive process. We possessed the original transcripts, but Audrey had removed the original tapes. As you are aware, retrieving data using a certified procedure can be time-consuming. We just received the evidence at the courthouse. Audrey deleted the recordings. Yes, Your Honor, we also have a tape of her admitting it. I had tricked Audrey into deleting my recordings. I had purposefully emphasized to Audrey that I was keeping tight control over all of the videos. After she set her small camera in my workplace, I updated a recording and saved it in several locations, including a thumb drive on my desk. Audrey felt she knew where I stored all of my copies. After Audrey deleted my copies, I worked hard to make Audrey believe she had deleted everything and that I was helpless. Now it was paying off. Judges dislike those who knowingly delete evidence. Audrey also lied to the judge, claiming she had never cheated and that I lacked evidence. Audrey is not off to a good start. I see, the judge told my wife's lawyer. Do the transcripts match the recordings? Yes, Your Honor. Do you want to question the authenticity of the recordings? Audrey's lawyer glanced at Audrey, who shook her head slightly. No, Your Honor. So that answers the question about the validity of the Post's existence and renders any basis for compulsion to sign ineffective. But I observed that all of these recordings took place before the posting was signed. None of these provide evidence of adultery following the signing. Yes, Your Honor. Here is the transcript of the final film as well as the video itself, which demonstrate Audrey's adultery following the signing of the post. Why is this being made right now? Until recently, this evidence was in police custody and had yet to be delivered to my client. It was part of an accident-related death inquiry. We weren't convinced the video still existed. The judge addressed Audrey's lawyer. Have you gotten a chance to review the video? Yes, Your Honor. However, we believe the video is inadmissible because there is no consent form. And if the video is permitted, there is no evidence that it was not recorded before the posting agreement was signed. My attorney. First, the video was taken on a public balcony with no expectation of privacy, thus no consent form is required. Second, we can verify that the occurrence occurred after the posting up was signed. Judge, how simple is that? My client paid for Audrey's travel tickets. Karen, Duke, and the hotel room where they had their secret meeting. That got me a few looks. Judge, did you agree to your wife's affair? She never sought for permission but I never agreed to or condoned her unlawful affairs. How did you pay for their aircraft tickets and hotel room? I contacted him before the video and asked how much money it would take for him to stop seeing my children's mother. I also mentioned that he could lose his job. Duke told me $2,000, two tickets to Jamaica, and three nights in a five-star hotel. We agreed, and I ordered vouchers for the tickets but Hotel Douche broke his promise and used the coupons for plane tickets and a hotel in Florida. My wife was away for a conference that weekend, so I received the receipts the following week. It was quite convenient to have Douche deceased judge. How do we know this is the hotel from the first image? You can see the hotel sign in the backdrop. How did you receive the video? I paid for it. Douche sold it to me on the night of his death. I have a receipt signed by him to confirm it. Was this unusual? No. When I learned of my wife's escapades, I asked him for evidence. Douche was accommodating enough to supply me with picture evidence. Why did you gather this evidence? What was the cause of divorce? Why? You were gathering information. Yes. Months ago, I mentioned to him that I thought it would be quicker and less expensive to acquire my proof directly from him rather using a pie. However, I eventually paid him to quit fornicating with my wife. Douche had called and offered to sell me another video. I compensated him $500 for the video. Audrey had informed Douche about the posting up. As you can see in the video, Audrey has breached the post-breakup agreement by banging three guys at once, as has her sister Audrey. 
If you need someone to attest to the video's validity and date, my wife's sister is seated right there. I pointed at Karen, and everyone in the courtroom turned to look at her. Wow. I found something that did not appear to turn Karen on. The judge scolded me for using vulgar language, and I apologized. The judge then inquired, Is that all you got from douche that night, staring directly into Audrey's eyes? That's all from that night. But he gave me with the majority of the recordings you see here today. He'd been doing this for months, including the hotel and airline expenses. I paid him about $3,000 in all. Audrey looked like her head was about to explode. My testimony about douche made her look like an absolute moron. My testimony led her to believe that practically the entire time she was screwing douche, he was recording their sex and talks in order to gain money and sell it to her husband for her divorce for a meager $3,000. Audrey would have paid him ten times more to not have taken the tapes again. Even though she was upset, having douche dead came in useful. Audrey's mind was turning, and I could tell. That must be all the vids he has. I was too careful with him to record anything during our latest hotel rendezvous. If he had anything more, he would have produced it by now. Audrey made a hurried judgment as I finished speaking. Audrey began whispering into her attorney's ear. Her attorney requested a quick respite because we were nearing lunchtime. The judge permitted it. When we returned, Audrey's attorney explained that he had just gotten a video of me committing a horrific crime that reflected on my character. It would also demonstrate that I had done an adulterous act, which was punishable under the post. Don Yupi, Audrey and Karen were willing to testify about the video's validity. The judge asked Audrey and Karen to verbally attest to the video's veracity. Audrey then explained, Until now, my sister and I were unwilling to imprison the father of my children. But now that I've realized how manipulative he is, I have to do what is right. They presented Audrey's video. It began showing the hotel door and someone yelling, Please stop! Then Audrey barged into the room, displaying me on top of Karen and screamed, What are you doing to my sister? And then Karen yells, He is assaulting me! Make him stop! Audrey grabs her sister, her phone hits the carpet, and the video ends. Unfortunately, the video also showed my meat solidly between Karen's legs. So what happened? asked the judge. I locked myself in the bathroom and informed my husband that if he didn't leave the room in two minutes, I would call the cops. I also told him that I had already uploaded the film to the cloud so he couldn't access it. And did he leave? Yes. Now I was in serious trouble. I turned back to Audrey's father and mother, who were glaring at me with daggers. Fortunately, my parents were home with the kids. I felt bad for Audrey's parents. They recently discovered what a gangbang 300 for their good daughter is, and their wicked daughter became their nice daughter's fluffer. They now assumed their grandchildren's father was an assaulter. Judge is looking at me. So what can you say for yourself? My lawyer, we've got a reply video. Let's see. Audrey's lawyer leaped out of his seat and attempted to discredit the footage before it was shown. Judge, so let's get this straight. You get to show your surprise film of the hotel meeting, but we can't view their surprise response video from the same hotel meeting. Is this what you were trying to say, counselor? The judge genuinely chuckled. Audrey's lawyer sat down quietly again. Audrey was already becoming white. I could hear her thoughts as if they were engraved on her forehead. It has to be a disturbing recording from the restroom. I had even placed one of my recorders at the bottom of the bathroom door and only picked up a few murmured phrases through the thick towel he had tucked beneath the door. The video began with us talking about being naked because of recorders. Audrey and Karen closed the video by giggling as they walked out the door for a few moments. When I remarked in the video that our legal system has failed to support couples, the judge gave me a sad look. The expression in his eyes informed me that he, too, was a victim of a cheating wife. He was acknowledging the poor status of our court system in terms of upholding marriage vows, or perhaps both. Audrey became aroused as the video played her charges that I killed Duke and began whispering into her lawyer's ear. Finally, her lawyer glanced at her and shook his head. No. Before we showed the film, my lawyer acknowledged that I had not incriminated myself with any of the statements in it. Audrey's lawyer was informing her. Nothing I said constituted an admission of guilt. Audrey's death was the only possible answer. I knew her first purpose had been to sweet-talk me into forgiving her. 
Her second purpose in the meeting had to be to deceive me into incriminating myself regarding Douche's death and Audrey's master plot. Karen's fabricated assault was now backfiring in Audrey's face. It was sad. Audrey appeared to believe she could outsmart me. She appeared to believe her affair was evidence. She was smarter than me, yet she didn't outsmart me. I had trusted her. She had hidden her affair behind the faith that one had placed in her. Now the confidence was gone. Karen attempted to flee when the video appeared. Rubbing my meat against her cat, she suddenly wrapped her arms around me and dragged me onto the bed on top of her. The bailiff seized her and sat her down. I was mistaken. Audrey felt some shame when the video showed her pleasure her own sister while taunting me. Audrey covered her face with both hands. I know she heard her parents gasp behind her. The in-laws left the court before the film was completed. They'd heard and seen enough. Audrey knew she wouldn't get any aid from her parents ever again. After the video concluded, the judge declared that the post-up would go into effect as planned. My lawyer then informed the judge that we recently discovered Audrey had a secret bank account, which she had not disclosed during the discovery process. The account held more than our other assets combined. Audrey had informed me that she received a check every four weeks. Instead, she received a paycheck every two weeks and had been depositing every other check and the majority of her bonuses into a secret account for years. She had also lately taken out all of the equity in our house with a second mortgage and transferred it to the concealed account. But I instructed my lawyer not to be too explicit in front of the judge and Audrey. My lawyer just gave the judge the bank account balance. The most recent transfer appeared to be Audrey transferring our mortgage equity into her secret account and preparing to flee. This greedy error was officially how the bank and lawyers discovered Audrey's secret account. I was responsible for transferring the second mortgage. Audrey's phone logins allowed her to do everything online. I noticed Audrey's account on the first day I installed the monitoring program. Hidden money that are not disclosed during the divorce discovery process are subject to particular laws. The judge, using his discretion under the law, awarded me 100% of the asset and ordered her to pay 100% of all attorney's fees and court costs. Fortunately for me, Audrey became greedy and transferred all of the house equity into her private account. Because of the judge's decision, I would no longer be required to give her half of the house's equity. The judge then sentenced Audrey and Karen to 90 days in jail for perjury. In the end, I received 95% of the assets, full custody of the children, the house, the two best of the three automobiles, child support for a few years, and alimony for five years. Audrey is almost entirely trusted by my parents, a successful job, and most importantly, trust from my children. Audrey received 90 days in jail, lost her hidden bank account, and was stabbed in the back by her affair partner from the grave. She lost her children's trust, forced to pay for 50% of the children. College damaged her career and her parents disowned her. The 5% she received didn't even cover half of her lawyer and court bills. She did receive her clothing, car, and jewelry. Unfortunately for her, I sold all of her expensive jewelry the first month after discovering her affair. I sold them when we were still blissfully married. They were in the safe, and I stopped taking Audrey anywhere pleasant. She had no cause to wear them, so she didn't notice anything missing. She could also not verify that I had sold them. I argued that she had sold the jewels and was attempting to blame me. I used the diamond money and the car wreck insurance money I received to buy my dream automobile. I had been saving the jewelry money for months so that I could combine it with the car wreck payout. I hoped to receive, if I had not received a settlement. It meant I was going too fast when I hit the tree, and the money would have gone towards my burial expenses. When Audrey went to jail, I alerted them that she and her sister were suspected of having HIV. I supplied the court copies of Audrey's and Karen's CDC letters. When they got out of prison, they were both bald. Karen was rumored to have licked another person's cat. Audrey spoke up for her sister, and they both became someone else's property. For the most of the 90 days, someone forced Audrey and Karen to shave their heads every day to demonstrate who owned them. It didn't seem to bother Karen, but Audrey returned, appearing somehow less than before. Audrey probably preferred to be licked rather than licking herself. The hairless skulls and short hair supported the HIV rumors. 
It took nearly two years for them to be HIV-free, but by then, everyone they knew assumed they had it. They had both started smoking while in prison, and it didn't help that they had lost so much weight. Every man in town knew who the HIV sisters were. Audrey and Karen living together also did not assist to reduce the stigma associated with HIV. By the end of their adventure, the HIV sisters were far less appealing. Both appeared ten years older and unhealthy. Audrey tried to be tough in order to stay close to the children. With her reputation, good positions were hard to come by, so she had to commute an hour away to a couple towns over. The children had been taunted due to allegations about their 304 mother. They were eventually shunned, since they were the children of one of the HIV sisters. They never forgave their mother, and were ashamed to be seen with her because there were no good guys interested in Audrey and Karen. They both began dating men who like using strong drugs, and were willing to share their ladies with their friends. Audrey and Karen's appearance suffered greatly as a result of their lifestyle. Audrey ultimately lost her real estate job. Nobody wanted to be shown a house by someone who was starting to resemble a crack. 304. Audrey finally stopped contacting the children and I was relieved. Audrey and Karen could only find work as bar waiters or strippers. They moved in with a man who is 14 years older than Audrey. A few towns away. He has gotten divorced five times. He is a registered sex offender and all of his children have shunned him. He spends the majority of his time traveling and is well known for screwing bar 304s and strippers in every location. Audrey and Karen are both screwing other men and women in his lousy house while he is away, most likely for extra money. I also forwarded Audrey's ex-boss's final words to six of the seven women husbands, the matronly lady who threatened to call the cops on me and boasted about douches to Audrey. Big meat. I personally played the recording for her husband and then told him everything Douche had talked about doing with other men's wives. I also played Audrey's video, in which she told how she covered for her boss every Thursday for years after meeting him at an office party. As he stood up to depart, I realized he had owned the real estate agency since before their marriage. He thanked me for Douche's death. I wanted to commend you on your driving ability. His parting comments were delivered with a cheeky grin. I'm going to burn her to the ground with the prenup every now and then. I get drunk and get texts left on my phone, generally from Audrey telling me how nice I had it and what I am missing while she is screwing her pet. Audrey and her sex buddies occasionally remind me about what I am missing in the form of taunts, enticements, or threats. I receive a video with the identical messages, except it is always while Audrey is being made airtight. Karen is always filming and offering comments from Karen's commentary. She either thinks Audrey's gangbanging is degrading to me, or she thinks I'll lose my head and rush over to grab Audrey back from the videos. I can confidently tell that I no longer lust after either of their physically, nor would many other men. On rare occasions, Audrey responds to voice messages and videos by wishing I were dead like a douche. Her life is entirely my fault, or that she will eventually get back at me. Typically, however, the messages and videos are followed by Audrey crying, telling me that I am the love of her life, pleading for my forgiveness, and hoping that we might reconcile someday. I keep every video and message in case Audrey decides to try to reintegrate into our children's lives. Acceptance. I accept that my wife never loved me the way I loved her. She has never known or will ever understand what true love is. For her, Life is defined by how much you take rather than how much you give. You didn't expect the end would involve my ex-wife accepting her fate, did you? I have a restraining order against that soulless witch and her insane sister. I believe they still harbor negative feelings toward me.